Welcome one and all to Puppet History. Today we're taking an ever winding look at yet another chapter in the heavy, heavy book we call history, while our guests ruthlessly compete for the coveted title of History Master. I am your beloved host, The Professor. Thank you. <gasps> Ryan Bergara, looking to maintain a four-week winning streak. Are you ready? Still alive. Yes, for, for you now. are. For now. Arya Intervong, our special guest. Are you ready? Oh, I'm very ready. It is a real treat to be here. Thank you so much for having <laughs> it's me. It's a pleasure to have you. Well then, let's crack in! To begin, have either of you ever had any surgeries? Maybe an appendix out or even wisdom teeth? Well, I personally am very blessed to have only had my wisdom. I had a root canal. Yeah, I hadn't gone to the dentist for like nine years. Oh. And so uh, by the time I went there, they said, oh yeah, these bad boys need to be taken out. And you also need a root canal. So I got a double whammy. I mean, among other things, yeah, nine years is a long time. It's a long time. After not, how many wisdom teeth did you have at that point? I had four. That had to be four. Pulled, Strong, pulled, pulled, smart. Pulled they, they were impacting the teeth in front of them too. Oh so. yeah. Makes sense. They pushed them forward, I think. My yes. dad's a dentist, so oh. Oh, okay. I kind of have like a little bit of a knowledge in this. In this Brag part. much. I said, brag much? Oh, no, I was just waiting for you to correct yourself because you were being rude. Oh. Anybody ever cut you, Ryan? Oh, my God. Let's ask the box. Maybe there's some answers in there. Don't oh. touch the box. If you touch the box, I'll fucking kill you. Okay, all right, whoa. A little aggressive there. Everything's fine. Are you guys afraid of surgery? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah, it seems scary. Going under the knife. Ooh. Not just that, but I'm scared of the, you know, the, the old Hayden Christensen movie, you know, where he's awake. I think it's called Awake. Oh, what? yeah, yeah, when the anesthetic doesn't work. Well, if the idea of surgery today is scary, imagine what it was like only a few hundred years ago. Actually, don't imagine, listen. Today, we're talking about Victorian medicine's greatest surgeon, Dr. Robert Liston. Okay, this seems like a guy up to no good already. Maybe. Ooh, are we talking about like a mad doctor? I don't know. Like you heard animal? of him? No, I haven't heard mm -hmm. of him. Never heard of him. You gotta imagine surgery in the Victorian era, probably not great though. Did they have an aesthetic back then? I think he was just bite down on this belt. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Let's take the arm now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's get into it. No one likes to be sick, but in the 1800s, getting sick was barely better than getting dead. And if you needed an operation, well, your choice really came down to how much pure suffering you could handle. Before the advent of anesthesia, not to mention germ theory, a doctor's visit was basically your last ditch effort to survive. In 1847, according to the New York Times, quote, physicians were only a few decades from medical theories inherited from the ancient Greeks. Not a fun time, yeah. I, I assume that like if you got stabbed or something was kind of like a mortal wound, they would just let you bleed out and die. And it's like, ah, oh, he's gone. I imagine their best effort was like cauterizing stuff with a hot sword or yeah. something. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's 1835 and you've both slipped on banana peels. I don't know how you've done it. Bananas won't really be around the US for another few decades, but you've both got compound fractures. What you gonna do? A, pray, B, See a doctor. Were you expecting a third option? Yeah, I, I, Sorry, yeah, it's 1835. Be glad you have two choices. Ooh, I mean. Ooh. Now, am I, am I answering this like me in that time, right? In that time. In that time. In that time. In that time. In yeah. that time, in that time. Beef boy stewing hard on this one. Beef stew. Yeah, yeah. The classic beef stew. The classic beef stew. Yummy. Okay, uh, Ryan, what you got? I guess I'm gonna go with Dr. B. Uh, I don't know, it feels weird because it does feel kind of like going to a doctor would only make my situation worse. Anyways, yeah, I don't think praying would do much. Okay, and Aria? I went the opposite, I said A, pray. Oh. You know? The praying ain't gonna do much either, but the doctor situation, that, that's gonna be unnecessary pain involved. Sure. You know, I may as well spare myself the pain. I think you're gonna still be in a lot of pain if your bone's sticking <laughs> out of your skin, though. That's true. Yeah, 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 yes. But maybe that. God will help. Yes. I yes. don't know. It's kind of hard to kneel and pray when your your, your <laughs> shin bone's popping out of your skin. I do agree that either way, you're kind of you're kind of fucked. Yeah. Well, God gave you the compound fracture too. Yeah, that's true. So why would He fix it? Maybe it's a test. A test. 
Yeah. Perhaps. It's always, everything's a test. The big purple guy tests us a lot. Um, well, uh, I'm going to give a point to Ryan for that one. Yes, Arya, uh, while prayer may have helped your soul, it certainly didn't help your body. Your leg had no chance of healing, and you would have gotten gangrene, which would have led to a little bit of blood poisoning, which would have killed you. I always thought it was funny that gangrene is also the nickname for the New York Jets, That's which funny. is appropriate because they suck balls. Oh. <laughs> and they always have, oh God. You know, I don't even like when you pretend to like sports references no, because I love it comes it. off as condescending. Dunking on the Jets. Take that, Jets. Now, on the other hand, with the doctor, I'm afraid your outlook has improved only slightly. The doctor is going to perform an anesthesia-free amputation. You're to drink a pint of whiskey, at which point you'll be pinned down by orderlies while a surgeon uses a long curved knife to cut the skin all the way around your leg, then through the muscle a few inches up. At that point, the knife will be exchanged for a saw so that while an assistant pulls your leg muscles back, the surgeon can saw through the bone. The critical arteries and veins will be literally tied off so you don't bleed to death. The muscle and skin will be stitched up, and Bob's your uncle. You're done. So you made it. Well, hope you're happy with your choice. Go to go, go to the doctor. Yeah, that sounds fucking awful. Resetting the bone was not an option. They just immediately go to cutting it off. Because that's normally what you would do with a compound fracture. Yeah, I don't think they were very good at it. So I think they would just, just lob it off. Victorian times don't seem that fun to me. You know, you had Jack the Ripper running around, you have this going on. Yeah. Nasty man. It's like, what did they have? You guys ever gotten even uh, stitches or anything? Oh, up here, my little scar up here was stitched. I was a little baby. I fell off the high chair. You fell off oh, the high wow. chair? Reaching for a cake. No. Big cake boy. Ain't that like Arya? Little yeah. Arya just wanted his little cake. I don't think I've ever had stitches now that I think about it. It's crazy that they just stitch you up. They just sew your skin together. I guess when you put it that way. I mean, you got eaten by a T-Rex. That's much worse than... Chewed me up and spit me out. Did it hurt? Oh, uh, yeah, must have. Nice. Well, if you are lucky enough to have a skilled surgeon, the whole ordeal might take less than a minute. Though there is no shortage of horror stories of the process taking longer. Like the surgeon whose saw got stuck in the bone and refused to budge. Yeesh. And even the lucky patients who didn't suffer any complications were barely able to describe the experience. As George Wilson, who had his ankle disarticulated in 1843, described four years after the event, quote, The horror of great darkness and the sense of desertion by God and man, bordering close on despair, which swept through my mind and overwhelmed my heart, I can never forget, however gladly I would do so. I like my ankles fully articulated. I don't yeah. want them disarticulated. It's when the skin separates from the joint. I don't like skinning. I don't like any of it. I mean, I don't like any of it, but in particular, I've never really enjoyed when people talk about skinning or scalping or any of that stuff. I once saw... Why are you laughing? <laughs> What's wrong with you? I think Arya is a serial killer. <laughs> uh, it would be, be kind of funny. No, <laughs> it wouldn't. <laughs> no. Speaking of skinning, I, I once saw a very funny image, which I'll show you later, Professor, if you want. I can show you in a moment of, of the green M&M skinning herself, and she's <laughs> chocolate. Oh, this is, this is because people were lusting after her, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. In this scenario, was the green skin kind of like yeah. clothes, or were they? Yes, it was like clothes. I see. But that, that's her skin. That's her skin. I that's see. That's her skin. Oh, that's, that's really gross. <laughs> <laughs> she really gross. Arya loves it. I'm going to look at his, he's going to show it to me on his phone, and I'm going to see that it's his wallpaper. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have a bunch of images of her. While the patient clearly had the short end of the scalpel, an operation wasn't exactly a picnic for the surgeon either. Slicing open a writhing wretch, blood shooting from their severed limbs as they screamed out for death. Look, you need to be prepared for such things. Unfortunately, training young doctors was extremely difficult in Victorian England. Hey, why? A, a lack of practice cadavers. B, interference from the church. Or C, 19th century heebie-jeebies about blood. Much to think about. My smart boys. Don't call us your boys. They're smart, smart little guys. Locked in. I'm gonna go with B, problems with the church. Time and time again, it seems like religion hates science, so I'm gonna just kind of ride that train. Yes, I'm going with B as well. I concur, <gasps> you know, we they always like to meddle in the affairs. B boys! Skirt, skirt, skirt. That's a sort of sneakers on the court. Uh, our second best bit. 
Just don't acknowledge it and maybe he'll shut Our up. Our second best bit. Hey, points to neither of you. Whoa. Yeah, that's right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no need to be nasty about it. Yes, in the early 1800s, getting your hands on a dead body was tough work. People were dying yeah. left and right. How could they yes, not? That's they like were, they a buffet. Were they weren't preserving them very well. Oh. Uh, that makes more sense. There's, there was a lot going on. There was also laws against dissection that meant that in 1823, for instance, instructors in Great Britain had to train almost 2,000 students with fewer than 100 legally obtained bodies. If I was a serial killer living back in the day, I would just become a doctor. I mean, that's smart, honestly. No one would get after you for malpractice like nowadays. Not that I've ever had this fantasy and played it out, but I'm just saying if I was going to do it, that's how I would do it. Now, what if that was what Jack the Ripper was doing? He was just obsessed with killing, doing it on the clock and working after hours. That guy was working after hours like Drake. Drake's not a murderer. Allegedly, as far as we know. Professor, you've already gotten tagged up once for a, a defamation lawsuit. I don't think you want another one. Oh, right, right, you're right. Drake is not a murderer. All right, moving along. <laughs> Winnie, nay, clop, clip, scared of snakes, etc. Oh, hey there, Dorothy Ruth. Hello, Professor. You know, I know you've got a lesson to get to, but I simply had to gallop over here to thank Helix Sleep for sponsoring this video. Professor, did you know that the average horse only sleeps about 2.9 hours a day? What? That's crazy, right? It's like... <laughs> What are we doing? Anyway, as I've mentioned, I've actually hit the dating scene after the mucky death of my husband, Stanley Melvin. So I've actually been spending a lot more time in bed lately. Thankfully, Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that are customized to fit your needs. And they're conveniently shipped right to your door. Oh, nice. And actually, my old mattress really stinks and I could use an upgrade. Here's my friend Meredith helping me set up. Look at it. Look at how easy it is. Look at that. Wow. Oh my gosh, it was a braise. What a good friend. Helix has a sleep quiz that matches your unique body type and sleep preferences to make the perfect mattress for you. They've got something for everybody. And if you sleep with a partner, you can even take the quiz together to find something that suits you both. Based on my results, Helix matched me with a midnight lux. I'm a lonesome side sleeper and I love a medium firmness. Not too soft, not too hard. I also opted for the Glacier Tex coating, which keeps the mattress nice and cool in the summer. Wow, it sounds like I I gotta get my fully corporeal paws on one of these mattresses. Well, it also comes with a 100 night sleep trial and a 10 year warranty, along with financing options and flexible payment plans. And if you don't like it after three months, guess what? They'll pick it up and you'll get a full refund. Look, I love my Helix and I think you will too. If you're in the market for a new bed, check out Helix by clicking on the link below or going to helixsleep.com watcher for up to $200 off your Helix Sleep Mattress Plus, two free pillows. Wow, that's incredible. Hey, thanks, Dorothy Ruth. <laughs> of course. Okay, I'm running late for a date with a Clydesdale named Elmer Walter Williams. We might eat some carrots, and if he clops his hooves right, maybe I'll show him my Helix. <laughs> See you later. Yeah, clop, 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 Bye, clop, Dorothy clop, Ruth. Clop, clop, clop. Ah, all right, where were we? Enterprising resurrectionists, AKA body snatchers, stepped up to fill the demand. The practice became somewhat routine, with one resurrectionist, Ben Crouch, admitting he had one span of four nights where he secured 23 bodies. Over the 1811 school term, Crouch claimed his team was responsible for delivering 406 bodies, each averaging a payment of seven pounds. In today's money, it meant that after expenses like bribes, a body snatcher could conservatively net $40,000 a year with little more than a shovel and a strong stomach. I mean, in a way, it's positive because they're helping advance medical knowledge. It's true. They weren't getting bodies anywhere else. Until the father of uh, a deceased son goes back to the grave the next day to pay additional respects, and it's just a hole. It's just a little IOU note. Yeah, it's <laughs> just like BRB, needed body. Are you guys going to donate your bodies to uh, science when you're dead? Yeah, sure. I don't give a shit what happens Sweet to your body after. I'm good. Although I watched uh, a video recently by Johnny Harris about uh, the illegal organ and body trade. Sometimes if you donate your body to the wrong, or you leave it to the wrong organization, like it can be sold out to be shown in like... Ripley's? Kind of like situations like that. There was like a convention in Portland where people were like gawking at a dead body. What? Yeah. Interesting. And, no, and they, were doing, they were performing surgeries on it. Too. What? I know. Wild. When I die, uh, can you just toss me into one of those claw machines? I'd rather toss you into a T-Rex mouth. You already did that, you piece of shit. 
Well, as grim a business as it sounds, without the body snatchers, it really would have been almost impossible to give budding doctors any hands-on experience, never mind how remedial that experience was in the first place. Since new doctors had only bare-bones training, it meant that, and this remains true today, the most important factor when going under the knife was who your surgeon was. And in the first half of the 1800s, there was no better surgeon than Robert Liston. <laughs> Why, because his success rate was 25% or something? Well, let's find out. Robert Liston was born on October 28th, 1794, in the manse of Ecclesmachen Linlithgowshire. His father, Henry Liston, was a minister and gave Robert most of his early schooling. At age 16, Robert became an assistant to a Dr. John Barclay, a professor of anatomy and physiology, and began training as a doctor in both Edinburgh and London, joining the Royal College of Surgeons of England at age 24. He soon gained a reputation as a skillful surgeon, taking on patients that the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh deemed inoperable. Patients would camp out in his offices for days in the hopes of getting a consultation, and Liston tried to see every one of them. One time I camped out 12 hours to see the dark night at midnight. Worth it, so I imagine this guy was also worth it. You ever wait out, camp out for anything, Aria? No, I've never camped out for anything. Not even to camp in the woods? Oh, I'm not a big camping boy. What's the longest line you've ever waited in? Disneyland lines. Sure. Yeah, 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 you gotta yeah. get that fast pass, bro. That's true. Woo! Hey, what helped make Liston such a good surgeon? A, hands so steady they never once slipped. B, a mind so sharp he had every published text on medicine memorized. Or C, he was big. What? <laughs> big in what sense? Yeah, like is he big in terms of stature or like? Big guy. Guy's a, a, an absolute fucking unit. Okay, Ryan, what do you got? I went with uh, C. Just, just an absolute fucking unit of a man. <laughs> I just think it's really funny that people back then would think, oh, he's a great doctor because he's so large. Aria, what do you got? I got a big boy too. I got a big boy mm. with an eye. Oh, sound the alarms. We got a couple sea dogs out there. Bark on That's good, that's good. Okay, we're gonna find out the via the magic of theater. I'll be right back, bye. Woo. I hope we see a really big puppet. <clears throat> Excuse me, is this the office of Robert Liston? My leg is shattered, and if it isn't removed, I'm as good as dead. Oi, this is Robert Liston's office, but you'll have to wait in line. I've been here for a day now, hoping he'd chop off me messed up foot. I hear the doctor's the smartest man to ever live. Hmm, not sure about that. Well, I also hear his hands are so true that he's never made a horrible mistake, like cutting off someone's balls on accident. Well, I've heard the opposite. Well, then what is it that makes Dr. Liston so great? Whoa! Oh! Uh, absolute fucking unit. Holy shit, Robert Liston is huge! No wonder everybody wants him to operate on them. Well, I wonder, do you think that Liston was, was he, uh, was he juicing up? I don't think so. so he's natural. I think that guy was just slaying a bunch of pigs and eating the fuck out of them every day. Woo! Points to both of ya! Yeah, you're a big guy, big, big guy. Yeah, when the job description is physically restraining your patient and then putting your back into sawing through their bones, the bigger the doctor, the better. And Robert Liston was a whopping six foot two. It was Victorian England, remember? Everything was a little bit smaller. Oh, so like by today's standards, he was like a seven foot boy. That's like three inches shorter than Shane Midday. If Shane was a doctor back in the day, they would have stood in line for him. Maybe. Well, Robert Liston wasn't only tall, he was also relatively clean, which was notable for a time when one of the main explanations given for illness wasn't bacteria, but instead, you must have pissed God off. Liston was insistent that limbs be shaved before operating, that surgical sponges be washed before surgery, and that he wash his own hands before sticking them inside of a person. Revolutionary stuff, though he did have this silly habit of, uh, holding a bloody knife in his mouth when his hands were otherwise occupied. Listen, and we've all got our own gross little habits. Yeah, I mean, three for four. Yeah. You know. Sort of ahead of the curve without even knowing it. That's crazy, because yeah, because you just said germ theory had just come. Was it just breaking onto the scene by the time this guy was no, there? No, we didn't even have it yet. Oh, wow, so he really uh, was ahead of the curve. Yeah. 
Now, Liston also stood out due to his concerns for the mental health of the patient. Makes sense when you'll likely be responsible for the single most traumatic minute of a person's life. As Liston wrote, a surgeon, quote, must consider his labor only begun when the operation is finished. The patient is yet to be conducted by kindness and judgment through the process of cure. It's a nice thought, but I don't think bedside manner really comes into play when you're ripping muscle off the bone. It's not gonna help me if you're like, are you feeling any pain? What he's getting at without, I think, even realizing it is that they'll probably have some sort of post-traumatic stress oh, of course, resulting yeah. from it and that they should be looked after and tended to for their mental health afterwards. Oh, I see what you're saying. I thought we were talking like bedside manner while he was doing the ripping. No, I'm sure he just did that as quickly as possible. Probably looked good while doing it. I mean, with a knife in his mouth, it's kind of sexy. I know, if he was doing it shirtless or something, I imagine now I understand the line. Well, on top of all this, of course, Liston was also a crackerjack surgeon, the fastest saw in the kingdom, able to perform an above-the-knee amputation in under 30 seconds. Though this wasn't known at the time, speed meant a body's insides had less time exposed to the operating theater's germ-riddled air. Oh my god, I forgot this was happening in a fucking theater. Oh yeah, baby. Wait I didn't a even second. realize it was happening in a theater. Now that I think about that, they probably made a killing on tickets. If this guy is jacked and probably handsome, and he's sitting there like, foot up, just <laughs> doing this, I'm sure people were in that theater. I mean, I'm sure sometimes maybe they let people from the public come in, but a lot of times it was like at uh, medical schools where um, trainees would watch, you know. Or, I don't know, maybe you could pay, who knows? People were sick back then, not a lot of entertainment. Honestly, if I were alive at this time, I think I'd pay money to go see this. I wonder though, like, did would he, since there's such quick sessions, did, is it like you do bundle like multiple back-to-back -back showings? Well, like, maybe. Do, do you just pay for a one thirty-second show? <laughs> bundle? <laughs> Three amputations for the price of one. That's the best I can do. That's the best I can do. <laughs> Liston's track record spoke for itself. While working at London's University College Hospital, around 10% of his patients died on the table, compared to a nearby hospital where 25% of patients were lost. It's easy to see why patients waited days for the privilege to be hacked to bits by old Bobby Liston. 25%, that's a, that's a hefty amount. That's a lot. That's a, that's a 10 lot. 10% also a little unnerving, but 25, you know, yeah. you're going in a place with a one in four chance of uh, dying on the table. Uh, I'll wait in line. Liston also wrote two textbooks on surgery and invented several surgical implements to aid him, including the Liston splint and locking forceps, which are still used today. Wow. wow. Impressive. Liston was known to quarrel regularly with other doctors and held his assistants to an extremely high standard. His combativeness was at least framed around what was the best care for a patient. And he made sure his assistants knew there was no ill will by inviting them to his home for dinner. Aww. Still, the good doctor did develop a bit of an ego. Since surgeries in the Victorian era often took place in a literal theater, Liston would call out to the crowd before his first incision, gentlemen, Time me. For their part, the audience withdrew their pocket watches and obliged. I feel like the one person that wouldn't have fun is probably the patient. I was like, about to say yeah, that. Yeah, that you take your time, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. If I'm sitting strapped down, being held down by orderlies, the last thing I want the guy with the fucking giant knife to be like is, time me. <laughs> it's pretty rude. Honestly, it's rude and they're awake. They could hear it all. <laughs> but again, if I'm in the audience, I'm loving it. Oh, sure. Yeah, but surgery should be an audience of one. <laughs> now, while Robert Liston was the best, he of course wasn't perfect. Once in Liston's haste to remove a leg, his knife took a testicle along with it. Oops! He accidentally cut someone's balls off? Allegedly that may have happened, yeah. What do you mean allegedly? I'm gonna need a firm yes or no on It's that. rumored to have happened. What, what was he aiming for? I'm going to assume he was probably aiming for something else. I don't understand mm. how you miss. You, does he get a big, big stroke? He's a big guy. It's a big stroke, and you yeah, actually Yeah, and it's not like the balls could be mistaken for any other body part. They're pretty distinct. And the balls are also cush like they're under. They're under usually the penis. I don't know. Look, we've we've all made mistakes. We've all accidentally chopped people's balls off. If he lops one of my testicles off, yeah. I'm gonna feel intimidated. I can't complain. I'm not sure. gonna throw up a lawsuit against this guy because yeah. he'll he's very scary. Look so you want me. a little doctor like Doogie Howser? Yes, because yeah. then I can be like Doogie. What the fuck did you do to my ball? <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> do I remember that episode. <laughs> Another time, when consulting on a neck mass in a child, Liston cockily stabbed it with a knife, believing it to be just an abscess. Turns out, it was uh, an aneurysm, which Liston didn't think a boy could suffer from, and the young man bled out. Awkward. Hey, what was Robert Liston's worst surgical mistake? A. He realized he was sawing off the wrong leg halfway through a surgery. 
B. The patient died along with two other people present. Or C. He mistook a patient for the patient's brother, resulting in both dying. All right, I think I got it. Oh, what are your answers? I'm gonna go with A, good news, bad news. The good news is we cut the leg off. The bad news is it's the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also going with A as well. Oh, double A's. You know, I just imagine that in his haste, you know, he's probably grandstanding and he's like, he maybe he's looking at the audience like a teppanyaki chef. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> teppanyaki chef. Um, anyway, let's find out via the magic of theater. I'll be right back with you. I wonder what's the acceptable amount of deaths on your watch for a surgeon nowadays. That's actually a very good question. Okay, I'm about to remove this dude's leg. Assistant, hold this rascal down. Uh, don't worry, Dr. Liston, I've gotten good and ouch! Oh, oops, <laughs> looks like he cut my finger off there. Oh, little wounds, oh. Uh, that's a problem, I suppose. Who? Uh, I say, I think your assistant has died of sepsis he caught from that rotten leg you're sawing. Why is Abraham Lincoln? <laughs> what you, what was that? Oh, oh, Jesus, dude. Watch where you're flailing that knife. What'd you say? Uh, oh, God, did you just cut me with that diseased knife? Oh, fuck. Sir? Sir? Oh, cripes, I think, I think that dude just died of fear. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, this, the patient died of sepsis. Oh boy, this is not my day. Bad day at the office. <laughs> Very bad day. Okay, points to neither of you. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, well, some dispute the authenticity of this story, as you should for any tale where someone dies of fright. But if true, this surgery is thought to be the only one in history with a 300% mortality rate. Yowza. That's crazy, man. Yeah, again, I'm guessing it's because of the time limit, but you're swinging that knife around. Very, very scary. Hey, imagine being at that show. Now that's getting your money. Now that's yeah. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. a hot ticket. The reviews were probably raving the next morning in the paper. It's like, oh my god, you hear about last week? Arya got tickets to the Triple H. <laughs> <laughs> now remember, this was from the best surgeon alive. With the hurdles of Victorian medicine, there was only so much that skill and a six foot two frame could get you. Luckily, a huge advance called the Yankee Dodge was right around the corner. Hey, what was the Yankee Dodge? Hey. Ether, B, surgical gloves, or C, a precursor to blood transfusion. I don't know. Okay, what do you got? I guess the, uh, I'm gonna go with A, the, the ether, ether, just cause of that one scene in blue velvet. Not one scene, he, you know you know what I'm talking about. I didn't know what ether was, so I didn't go with ether. Are you? Surgical gloves. Surgical gloves. Yeah. Well, a point to Beef Boy! Yay. Yay! First synthesized in 1846 from a mixture of sulfuric acid and alcohol by William Morton, a dentist practicing across the pond in Boston, ether was proving revolutionary in dental procedures. Perhaps it could work for other operations as well. In Victorian surgery, it was no secret that the patient being awake and upset the whole time was affecting outcomes. Some doctors had even experimented with hypnotism, without success, in an attempt to subdue patients. Within weeks of William Morton successfully removing a tooth on an ethered patient, Liston saw where the future of medicine was heading, and he ushered it in personally. So wait, exactly, what is ether? It's like a, it's like a gas. Con yes, it's like a, con like a common. It's kind of like laughing gas, isn't it? A little bit. If you have too much of it, it'll, uh, you'll pass out. Well, let's talk about the first surgery with ether. On December 21st, 1846, a hastily assembled crowd gathered in the University College of London's operating theater to watch 36-year-old butler Frederick Churchill lose his leg. His right knee had a bone infection, causing it to swell into a grotesque bend. The leg was coming off. He may as well try to catch some Z's while it happened. You know what? Honestly, at this point, I'm taking it. If yes. the alternative is to be awake while they yes. cut my leg yes. off. I agree. I'll Take give it a whirl. Churchill inhaled from the ether, and within minutes, he was out cold. Liston turned to the crowd, told them to time him, and a mere 28 seconds later, the leg was gone and fully sewn up. Churchill hadn't even flinched. Waking a few minutes later, Churchill's first question was when the surgery was supposed to begin. I imagine, to his great relief, Churchill was shown the stump under his hip where a leg had once been. The audience was blown away as Liston yelled out, this Yankee Dodge beats mesmerism hollow. It was a new dawn for medicine, ushered in by one of a now bygone era's greats. 
I guess you would have hoped the triple homicide would have made him drop the whole time me act. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. oh. Well, no, you got to up the ante because people are expecting more of these subsequent shows. Yeah, you know? I guess. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Glad the ether worked. Unfortunately, Liston didn't get to see the leaps and bounds that surgery would take in the coming decades. On December 7th, 1847, less than a year after performing Britain's first surgery with ether, Robert Liston died of a ruptured aortic aneurysm at age 53. Robert Liston was one of the quickest surgeons to ever live, but he had shown how to make speed obsolete in the OR. Until ether and its less caustic, less explosive cousin, chloroform, operating on any part of the body was essentially impossible possible apart from amputation. Now that pain during surgery was no longer standing in the way, however, the field exploded. For almost a century after Frederick Churchill snoozed through his leg being sawn off, journals of medicine published breakthrough after breakthrough in the field of surgery. Now, before ether, amputation mortality rates at Massachusetts General were 19%. What were they after? Now, this is another open-ended question, but I can tell you it's between 1 and 99%. So they were at 19% before anesthesia. Ryan, what do you got? I go 1%. You go 1%? Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> okay. I think you're a tricky little uh, little sneak. I little am, thing. but that's not the answer. Aria, what do you got? <laughs> I uh, originally went with seven, then changed it to a nine. Okay. I figured like it went down, but I can't imagine it went down that drastically that quickly. Well, you're both wrong. Aria is closest, uh, but with ether, mortality rates actually went up to 23%. What? Oh, because they probably got a little more ambitious in what they were trying you to do. You know what? Okay, Ryan, you get a jelly bean for that one. You're correct. Well, as Beef Boy pointed out, now that a surgeon didn't have to deal with writhing, screaming patients, they were more willing to try riskier stuff. Yeah. Plus, operating theaters were now used even more frequently, with almost no concern for their cleanliness, meaning they got pretty gross. Though the pain problem had been solved, Louis Pasteur was only just getting started in the late 1850s, and infections were still total mysteries. On the other hand, though, if they didn't push the envelope there, they, we probably wouldn't have all the advances we have today, so. Oh, for sure. Most yeah. surgeries, you're lying on a bed of bodies. That's right. A mountain of corpses. So I guess we should be grateful. We yeah. should be grateful for the sacrifice. Today, in the UK, your odds of dying during scheduled surgery is 1 in 100,000. Literally 10,000 times better than under Robert Liston's knife. It's easy to look back on history and shudder, but it's also important to recognize that we're the future's history. Yeah. Hopefully, progress means that 150 years from now, medicine in this decade will seem barely removed from the time of orderlies holding down our limbs while we cry out for mercy to a deaf and uncaring God. What's that as a percentage? I believe that's point zero 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 one percent. Ah, that is a good uh, odds. No, do it now. Do some surgery on me. <laughs> Never tell me the odds unless it's surgery. Well, that's about it, folks. What do you guys think of Robert Liston? That was great. I mean, I, mean, I mean, love a good showman. Yeah, you know, the greatest showman. I'm surprised Take that, that Hugh Jackman. <laughs> there should be a movie made of this man. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. They should just name it that again and make this into a musical. <laughs> yeah. Imagine someone just fucking spelting out From singing now on while he's while he's just <laughs> going to town on a leg and the person screaming is harmonizing. I like it. That sounds like a Golden Globe winner to me. Me too. Well, that concludes our history lesson. I'm going to go tally the scores to see who gets what they have coming to them. Before I do that, though, normally we've got a musical guest, but, oh god, this is so embarrassing. We didn't book one in time. Oh no, I'm so bad at my job. Anyway, let me plug in the numbers to the victory algorithm. Boop, boop, boop. Oh wow, Ryan won! Ryan, you did it again! Hooray! Um, uh, sorry about that, Aria. Uh, it's okay. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Valiantly played, though. Um, you know, Ryan, we actually ran out of moisturizer for today's episode, so today's prize is a big ol' hit of Puppet Vape. It's super unhealthy and dangerous, but oh boy, is it tasty after a long day of thinking. And you've been doing a lot of thinking this season, so come on, it's, it's good and healthy. You'll, you'll, you'll love it. Well, it is the fifth episode. It's the fifth episode. And you wouldn't <laughs> I mean, do I need any... you for the sixth, yeah, you true. know? You wouldn't do anything crazy on camera. No, no, no. Take a big, big hit of that. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. That's actually, that's pretty good. You want some? You want, is this an indica or is it? 
Oh. There you go. Aria, you know, actually, Aria, I don't know if it's your... Uh, yeah, you don't have to drive after... You gotta drive. Yeah, you got, yeah, yeah, probably not the best. Uh, what flavor is this? Uh, Yankee Dodge. Hey, you got that photo of the green M&M &M on your phone? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'd love yeah, to see yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hold up. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, you got, I gotta scroll up through my... Uh, scroll, yeah, scroll through... To, well, you got a lot of them on there. Oh, I've got different characters. Uh, you big Wally. <laughs> I've never seen Wally like that. Uh... Hold up, I'm gonna go through all these. Wally's circuit's fully exposed. Hold up, give me one moment. I got the Mucinex uh, demon too. Mucinex? Mucinex, okay, I'm gonna show you this. This isn't definitely not camera friendly. Well, I've got several options of it. Well, this is, oh, this is the one with her skin. Rise and shine, old pal of mine! <laughs> Damn it, I knew you were up to something. Oh no, you're on to me! Whatever am I going to do? I guess I'll just never untie you! <laughs> what is happening? Who are you? Oh, now you want to learn about the past! Go figure! All right, fine! Welcome, one person, to your demise! Today, we're taking an ever-winding look at how Ryan Vergara is going to die so I can inhabit his flesh! Let's crack it! Now, to begin, hey, you remember when you conned the real professor into his death last season? And remember that genie killed all those other puppets? Well, in purgatory, their approximation of souls had a little funeral for their beloved professor. And as part of the ceremony, I was a hologram programmed to try to soothe their sadness. And I did an incredible job. I gave a distinguished and stirring performance, and everyone felt very good afterwards. Words. Now, after the memorial, those damned puppets really put up a stink about the whole mess and begged the jokerified cosmic being known as God to undo everything. He was sympathetic, but stressed that he was still really exhausted from that Suez Canal prank he pulled, which he described as, quote, David Blaine level stuff. So, he insisted he gotta take a little thousand year nap, but says the puppets can send one representative back to reality to sort the whole mess out. And the puppets, oh, the stupid simple puppets elected me, the hologram, figuring, hey, I've got the professor's thoughts and memories. If anybody can mend calamity, it's the professor! So, then what happened? Well... No history point for you! May your dipshit soul suffer unending torments in the deepest chasms of hell! May your bones shatter and your lungs fill with black oil! May that's, your... that's great. Thank you for uh, reading for us today. Oh. Okay. Uh, I can take it again if you've got any notes. Uh, uh, honestly, it was great. We'll be in touch. Uh, I mean, you know, I can tone down the bile stuff if you're going for a younger demo or... Uh, as I said, we'll be in touch. Oh, I get it. Cool. Okay, huge waste of time. Who the fuck are we gonna get to host this show? Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone! It's me, the Professor! Uh, what? I, hey, big fan. I'm the estranged producer of this show. I don't know that we've met. Didn't Ryan mention you were tossed into dinosaur times? I'm surprised to see you in the flesh. Yes, I was sent to help... Flesh? Yeah, flesh! How, how did you even... What, hey, you know what? I'm not gonna look a gift horse in the mouth. You're here, that's all that counts. Season five, baby, it's back on! I gotta tell Ron... I gotta tell NordVPN! Oh! Yes. Flesh. Flesh. Must become corporeal. Must taste jelly beans! So here I am. It's a lot of details, sure, but I will not be issuing an apology for the rich complexity of my fascinating life. Anyway, ooh, what happens next? A, I cut your skin off with a little knife. B, I adhere your skin to my cute little body and finally know what it's like to feel. Or C, with my wonderful little hands covered in real skin, I'll finally rub the genie lamp and wish for a soul, for all food on earth to be jelly beans, and for all living creatures to be turned into puppets. <laughs> I'd, I'd say all of the above, but you don't have the lamp. I tried to buy it and I got outbid. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah, you got there all by yourself, a jelly bean for the beef boy. <laughs> 
Oh, speaking of. Hey, guy. Oh, sorry. Are you shooting? Um, there, we got a package for concupiscence. Mc oh, Connie. Here you oh, go. Oh, thank hey, buddy. you. Look at that. Is this yours? Okay. Right Ooh, a little lamp. That's nice. Oops. Hey. Hey. All right. Uh, good luck here. Are you not? Shane. I'm not getting involved hey, in this. Hey, are you not seeing this? Thank, thank you, Shane. <laughs> You're not going to get away with this. A rotten jelly bean for the beef boy. I am going to get away with that. I'm going to oh, hey, look. It's been a rough day. I've got a Cracker Jack idea. It wouldn't be a puppet history episode without a dumb little ditty. So let's turn that little frown upside down with the bravura performance from your humble substitute. Who's, 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 who's that? I asked the friendly face in the mirror. Oh, sharp glasses, little bow tie in a hat. The answer couldn't be any clearer. Well, I'm the spitting image of your favorite fuzzy host. And I'm the best you got considering his ass is toast. But bad news, just might know what you see. Turns out I'm just a nasty hologram. I think, at least I think, I think, therefore I kind of think, I think that I am. Well, this tech has got me halfway to corporeal. I can kick and bite, but it'd be nice to feel for real. Sucked. I mean it this time. Oh, that cuts deep. I'll remember that when I'm carving you up. Speaking of, you hang tight while I grab my adorable little knife. <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> hey, 
Hey, somebody help me! Oh, 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 what's all the commotion out here? We little studio rats are trying to catch some Z's, big fella. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah? I don't have a lot of time to explain, but just, you can talking? you come over here and shoot through these ropes? What? No. He's gonna kill me if you don't. He's a madman. Rope doesn't sound too tasty. As an omnivore, I mostly eat fruits, vegetables, meat, and when I'm very stressed, my own children. Okay, well, how about this? How about if I uh, get uh, Steve Lim to cook you a custom Steve, dish on Dish Granted? Whoa, 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 you talking about Big Apple Steve? Yep, the Big Apple Steve. Whoa, now that sounds like a sweet deal. All right, you got it. Let me get my little teeth around that rope. Whoa, 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 whoa,